chapter 2. <clears throat> We're going to continue where we left off two weeks ago. Pick it up and go from there. 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to read verse 5, verses 15, 16, and 17 to you. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I've named this the beast of cosmos, and the reason the word world, is, there are two Greek words for the word world, cosmos and aeon. Aeon means age. Satan is the god of this aeon or age, this dispensation. But he's also called the prince of the power of the earth or of the world. He's, also, he's called the prince of the world, which is cosmos. Here's the word is cosmos. And I want to take a look again at this word cosmos. I named it the beast of cosmos because in the book of Genesis, I mean Exodus, God said that he will not drive out the inhabitants before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field multiply against you. And the beast of the field is something I have never had explained to me. And I had a problem with this concept of the word world when I met Jesus. When I was 21, I met him. I didn't know a thing about him until I'd met him, but I knew a lot about the world. But when I met him, all I heard people tell me was don't sin. And they said, watch out for the world. And it was very vague terminology. I didn't know what they were talking about. So it drove me into the word to find out some specifics about the world. And the word world is called cosmos. And the reason I'm teaching this here with the youth is because it won't be long until you you're going to be getting your own place, living in your own apartments, your own homes, and getting married and raising your own kids. But before you get that far, you're going to have a few years of living by yourself and making your own decisions. And before you do, it would be good to know what's out there because it's a very interesting world out there. And you've heard that when you think, well, as a youth, you look at it and say, hey, no big deal. All right, no big deal until you find out what's there. But the word world is cosmos, and cosmos means an orderly arrangement or organization, a well-planned system, harmonious function, or perfect order. It also is used on the word adornment. Now turn for just a moment to 1 Peter. I'm going to read you something in the word adornment. And I'll show you why this word is so important. Cosmos. 1 Peter chapter 3. And I'm going to start reading with verse 3. Now, Peter's talking about the young ladies and how they should conduct themselves in the manner of dress. And it says in verse 3, who's adorning, let it not be. That word adorning is cosmos. And I'll show you why that word is translated that way in the King James and what it means to us. Who's adorning? Cosmos. Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in sight of God of great price. And then also, by the way, the word adorn in verse 5 is cosmio, which is K-O-S-M-E-O. -E so it comes from the same word cosmos. So the word adorning means this, that ladies' apparel or ladies' dress is called an adornment something in which they dress themselves by or fit themselves to the pattern of their own desire. They choose their own wardrobe, which is appealing to their own desires and makeup. And there's no sin in that. There's nothing wrong with that. Except if it comes out of the word world cosmos, this world's cosmos, which means there is a, an adornment or a, a dressing of this world system. And Satan is the chief uh, dress designer of this world. He took the world and he draped upon her his own choice of desire and pattern of, of clothing. He's the one that gave the world the wardrobe that she has today of which she wears. She portrays and reflects her wardrobe to the world which is appealing to the world. The world is uh, dressed according to what appeals to you. How many of you know that? The world is set out there to appeal to your desires. Anybody know that here? I guess there's three or four of us. <laughs> Uh, it was set there for the express purpose to appeal to what or to appeal to your desires or what is uh, desirable to you so it can lead you into it. And I want to make you wise of it because the world has been dressed and Satan himself is the chief wardrobe designer. He was the one that designed the clothing that fit it. Yeah. 
Now the word cosmos is also translated fitted. I'm sorry, trimmed, not fitted, trimmed. T-R-I-M-M-E-D. Which means, very interesting, when he begins to dress the world, he trims it. Now all you have to do is look at some of the clothing and it's been well trimmed. And some of it, there's not much left. It's been well trimmed. And that's what it means, is to fit it tightly and snugly so that the world can manifest her shapes, which are appealing to the eyes. Now the reason God is teaching the body of Christ is because we are not aware of what is in the world and what, are, what is it, its effects in our lives. Now, this is what we taught on last week. I'm not going to go back into that. But I will show you right here that the mind behind the system, the one that's controlling this system or this cosmos is not God. And that's why so many things take place in the world that is not God. God is not, he does not have the control of the earth as it is or this system. Now, he's given the authority into the hands of his believers. We are the one in control of it. We're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. And we are the one that have the authority that may, should be the one that are designing the light or the pattern of which the world should choose. We are to set before them the opposite way. We should be adorning the world with our presence, which is his holiness, which is a meek and gentle spirit, so that the world will be attracted to us. Well, the fact of the matter is the world is not attracted to the Christian lifestyle. It's too drab for them. They want something a little bit more flashy. So Satan will appeal to that desire and give it to them. And we're going to look at some of the things that he appeals to. But the mind behind the system is Satan himself. Now I want you to look at a scripture in Ephesians chapter 6. Just a confirmation of this. Ephesians chapter 6. And verse 12 says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And that word, in the middle there, it says, The rulers of the darkness of this world, the word world is cosmos, and the word ruler is kratos. So that literally means a world ruler or a cosmos kratos. Now I'll show you why he says that there. It means a world ruler. There is sent into this earth through Satan, which is called the, uh, the uh, uh, ruler of the darkness of this world in, in the Ephesians King James book, but in ours it's called, or in the Greek, it's called cosmos kratos, which means a world ruler that's not God. And there is a ruler of this world system that has a harmonious system and principle and its ultimate dress or wardrobe of which you see is to draw you away from God into her lap into her bosom to destroy you. Well, you young men that have problems with ego, let me share something with you that will bring it down a little bit where it ought to go. <laughs> that Proverbs says that a woman can reduce a man to a piece of bread. You ought to keep that in mind because the world can take a Christian into her bosom and reduce the body of Christ, a Christian, to a piece of bread to where their Christian life is worthless. And she's adorned to do that. We're going to look at her attractions tonight and what she uses, what Satan has used to dress her or to fit her and then trimmed her back, caused her to be lean and more appetizing. So let's look at now. Not that one there. It's the next one. Sometime we'll get into that. Maybe three men in Cosmos. But that's not the one I'm going in tonight. Okay, three attractions of the Cosmos. I want to show you how she's dressed so that you can learn to spot her. First of all, I want you to listen to me before you look at the chart. Everybody usually starts reading it and you don't hear what I say. But man is triune. He's spirit, soul, and body. He's spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. In all three of these areas, I have the same thing. Letting you know that this world has an attraction that appeals to one and all three of those men. Satan has dressed the world to appeal to your body. He's dressed the world to appeal to your soul. And he's dressed the world to appeal to your spirit man. And when we see that through the scripture, it'll make us wise in being able to say no to the attractions of this world. And in the word attractions of cosmos, you could just put the adorning of cosmos because that's what it is. It's how Satan has taken his clothing, his wardrobe, dressed her, hung around her the jewels and the, the diamonds and the rings and the necklaces that appeal to the natural man or the fleshly man. So what he appeals to here, the reason I have this on this next one, the three men in cosmos, is simply because they're called natural man, spiritual man, and carnal man. There are three people in this world. I'll have to touch on it for just a moment. You are a triune man. Before you met Jesus, you were called natural man. Before you become a real spirit man, you're going to go through a process of carnality. 
which is a transaction of a lot of fleshly demonstration until you finally make Jesus your Lord. You don't have to, but lots of people do. That means carnality is Christians that are appealing to their still going to the way of the flesh when they shouldn't or don't have to. The word natural man in the King James is sukikos. Sukikos is a Greek word, which we get the, the, also the word soul is suke, soulish man. So we are a soul. This soul man is made up of the mind, the will, and the emotions. Satan has set out there to attract the mind, the will, and the emotions. He wants to captivate the thoughts and the reasonings. Now, one of the most demonic countries in the world, in fact, their, their social order is communism. And the statement has been made by communist rulers that they can take the United States and never fire a shot. You know how they had, what they had in mind? The youth. Give me their brains, they said. So, Jesus wants your body, a living sacrifice, and renew your mind. Let him have your brain and not the world. Because the world will destroy it. Jesus Christ will heal it. So, what God is doing is in these three men, the natural man... And then the carnal man is sarkikos, and the word sarx is flesh. Flesh is sarx. Sarkikos, flesh rule. So you have a natural man, sukikos, is controlled by the soulish realm, which is self-life. You have a sarkikos, which is a pneumatikos, or spirit, pneuma, spirit man, governed by the sarx of the flesh. See, he's born of the spirit. He's a pneumatikos man. He's a spirit man, but he yields his members, his flesh, to the devil. The Roman says, don't do that. Don't yield your members, servants, because whomever you yield yourself a servant to, you, that thing becomes the Lord over your life. So we're not to yield our members to the world. We're to yield our bodies, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto Jesus, which is our reasonable service. Now, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. I'm going to give you three scriptures that are not up there that'll help you un understand our direction now. If you hold fast to this and pay attention, it'll be a tremendous safeguard for your life. You'll learn to spot this thing. When she, this world comes down the road prancing, you don't give way to it. You recognize her adorning, and you turn from her. And verse 23, 523 of 1 Thessalonians, the very God of peace sanctify you how? W-H-O-L-L-Y, which means completely. And he tells you which one. I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God's ultimate purpose is to begin to deal with the absolute control of your spirit, your soul, and your body. He wants all of man to be preserved blameless, totally. Go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. Chapter 2. Verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. He formed him of the dust of the ground, which represents what part? The body. Breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. What part is that? Spirit. And he became a living what? Soul. So in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established that man is spirit, he has a soul, he lives in a body. And Satan wants control of any one of those three. When you're born again, he has no access to the spirit except to go through the soul realm first, the mind, the will, or the emotions. When he goes through the thought realm, if he can captivate your thoughts and get them long enough, he'll get into your spirit realm. And we don't want him in there any longer. Thank God we're born of the spirit of God. He has no place in my heart. Thank God I like what Jesus said. The prince of this world or the, the uh, uh, prince is the, uh, the authority or the prince of power, the power of this cosmos cometh and hath nothing in me. Which means Jesus proved that on all three levels he defeated him. And that's what we're going to find out tonight in your life. All right, three attractions of cosmos. Look what they say. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. First John, go back to it again. Let's read it. First John chapter 2. Now, if you're using this chart rather than your Bible, shame on you. Get your Bible and use it. First John chapter 2. Verse 15 again, love not the world. Two things, do not love the world, neither the things. You see, there's not only just a worldly system, an order or a power out there that is controlling this, this defeated world that's under judgment, but there is the things that he uses to do that, to control it. So love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Now look at verse 16, for all that is all, A-L-L, -L, all that is in the world. The, here's one, lust of the flesh, 
Lust of the eyes and pride of life. The word life is bios, which means livelihood. One of the major attractions to the world is a livelihood. Did you know that? You know what, the, you know what Satan's system that he's created right now to appeal to the livelihood? And he sends all the youth to it. Most of them, except the ones that finally get their head on straight. What is it? That's going to deflate some. You may, may, may not appreciate, appreciate what I'm going to say, but it's nonetheless true. It's called college. It's the love of knowledge. And college is to show you what your bios is, your livelihood. Go and I'd like to be this and I'd like to be this, be this and be that. I'm going to major in this and I'm going to minor in that. And you haven't even asked Jesus what he wants you to do. It's called your self-life. The pride of life. I want to be a doctor. Pride. I want to be a lawyer. Pride. They don't want to do it because they want to help people. <laughs> Most of them. I'm not saying all in the same way. But the major motive behind that is demonic. If you don't ask God, Jesus, my life is not my own, but it's yours. I've given you my life. Obviously, if you have, you don't seek your own life. But he that seeketh his life will lose it, but he that loses his life will find it. So you give it to Jesus say, Jesus, I give you my life. I'm not going to college to learn about bios or my own life. I'm going to go if you want me to go or if you send me. Because I tell you what, if you'll serve Jesus, now listen to me very intently, if you will seek Jesus and the kingdom of God, he'll tell you exactly what he's called you to do. It may be a doctor, but it won't be an Ishmael, it'll be an Isaac. It won't be the work of the flesh, it'll be work of the Spirit. Which means it may be the very thing that you want to do. It may be the very thing that you're desiring to do. But unless you go through the channels of God, you're going to pull an Abraham. You're going to have a work of the flesh. And you don't want that. What God wants to do is reveal to you what He's called you to do, and you won't have the pride of life because you won't, the reason the pride of life won't be there is simply because you wasn't the one that chose it. You have nothing to be proud about. You see what I'm saying? That's what helps us. All right. How many are still here tonight? Amen. How many have left but still here tonight? All right. Let's go to another scripture just to confirm this. Well, let me talk about it for just a moment. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Lust of the flesh is sarks, the carnal sarkikos, inclined toward the lower-based nature. That guy can get into some perversion that even animals won't do. Lust of the eyes, pleasures of self preoccupied with self. When did Adam become aware of himself? Before or after the fall? After. And I tell you what, guys, guys that, and ladies too, that walk down the, the, the malls and every window they'll pass that reflects their image and they're giving it this, has got a problem. You are preoccupied with self-awareness. Self-awareness will kill you because it doesn't, doesn't do anything but build the ego. And you go by and you get, you, once in a while you go, hmm, just kind of checking the old bot out because you're proud of it. And what it happens, it's called the lust of the eyes. That which you see, and the first thing that teenagers see, there comes a process when you become aware of yourself. And it's true. You become aware of your body, your hair, everything. You become aware of yourself. Now, there's nothing wrong with that if you allow Jesus to govern it and lead it, and not the world. Because the world will put pressure on it to get into a certain position. You know, the perfect bod, number 10. And so everybody competes with competition and jealousy and envy to get there and have no idea that envy, jealousy, and strife is of the devil. It's called earthly, sensual, devilish. It's called the wisdom of the cosmos, wisdom of the world, James called it, wisdom of this cosmos that causes us to get into competition and jealousy and envy and strife and all the stuff to prepare the body physically when he ought to prepare it as a temple of the Lord, spiritually. And I'm not saying neglect the physical body. I don't either. I, I have a pretty rigid training for my own physical body because I believe my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And I think he enjoys living in there. I trust that he does. So I don't defile the temple, but I'm not concerned about self-occupation. I'm concerned about Jesus' occupation. I look away from all that would distract unto Christ, the author and the finisher of my faith. Don't you do that? Amen. I believe you do. Pride of life. The word life, as I said, is bios, and it comes from two Greek words, bi and bio. Bi means into two parts, double, two, or on both sides. So all you see is two. When you see bi, you see two. Bio is the mode or manner of life. So it means double standard of living. When you are in the cosmos with Christ, you have set before, set before you, I've set before you this day, blessing and curse, life and death. In this world system, you have on one side the, pow, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. On the other side, the law of sin and death, which is on one side, according to Genesis, 
the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life. So, since we are spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body, which part of man is inclined toward what? What man goes the way of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? The soulish man, the man of the earth. What man goes the way of the, of the tree of life? The spirit man. So you have something that needs to be dealt with. You have desires for God, and you're going to have a desire if you don't govern yourself and be sober-minded. Satan is going to try to tap into the soulish realm or the flesh realm and draw you away unto the world. And he wants to captivate that. And what God set before you is the tree of life and do not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I want to share something with you that I, that I want you to think on for just a moment. He said, do not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that thou partakest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Yeah. The tree of the knowledge, knowledge now, the tree of knowledge, I want to know what is right and wrong, good and evil. So you're faced with a decision in life. And when you start to make that decision, don't ever, as a Christian, don't ever refer to, should I or shouldn't I, based on is it right or wrong? Because he said the same tree, uh, the tree of the knowledge of evil, will kill you as well as the same tree, the tree of the knowledge of good. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's good things to go to church, but how many do you know that go to church and they're spiritually dead even though they go? It's good to go. It's good to pay your tithes, but it brings no life. How many of you know that have done that? You know anybody that does that? I do. They sit in church every time it opens because they think it's good. Well, it's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to teach my kids, and it's killing them. They're sitting there spiritually dead and don't even know it. What they are to do, and what you and I are to do, is when I have a decision to make, instead of going the way of the world and letting college tell me what to do, or tradition tell me what to do, or even religion tell me what to do, or all this other stuff, music tell me what to do, I go to final authority. It's called the Word of God. Yeah the tree of life, that which will reproduce within me life toward that direction, not knowledge. Everything reproduces after its own kind. If I seek the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it'll just tell me what I know to do. But it won't produce life. But if I go because God has told me to do or instructed me to do, it'll reproduce life. Yeah. When I was asked to come and share here, the only reason I come is because it, it's the tree of life. It's either God told me or not to, regardless of who invites you. Why do you go? Well, it's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to teach. It's a good thing to preach. But does it reproduce life? Is it God? Bottom line, final authority. Is it the Word? Is it God? So we want to be wise to that because what the world will do, and that's what he's, the world of Satan is doing with a lot of Christians. He knows. Now, let's be honest with one another. He's not that ignorant. He knows that there's some of you in here that, have, that love Jesus so much. I know some of you personally. Bubba's one of them, and I, I know probably a half dozen more Christies than other, and a few more that I know personally that love Jesus so much that they wouldn't do certain things that are obvious, like steal or lie. I mean, just downright steal somebody's car or motorcycle or, or icebox. So since they're not going to yield to that, where do you think they might yield to? Since they're not going to go to the tree of the knowledge of evil, they know not to do that, but are they as wise on the tree of the knowledge of good? Are they? I hope to think we are, because both of them reproduce the same effects, death, spiritual death, yeah. which means I know Satan is not going to come to this two, these two people with some temptation like that, but believe me, he's coming. Yes, he the Word of God says Satan cometh immediately when the Word of God is taught, and also in Ephesians he calls it the evil day, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. In the world, in the cosmos, you're going to have persecution and trouble. He's going to come, folks. But you've got to know which way he's coming. Is he coming in the spirit, soul, or the body realm? And if you'll learn that, that this world operates on one of those three levels, with either the lust of your flesh, well, he's not going to uh, go to the, this young man's lust of his flesh in some type of adultery or fornication, if he's committed to Jesus. I know this brother right here, too. His commitment to Jesus is not going to do it. So we can rule out the lust of the flesh in that area. But what about other areas? Lust of the eyes? What about the pride of life? Danger zone right there for... Christian, young Christians, the pride of life, because you want to know what you are to be in life. Let's go to another one. Let's go right now to what Eve did. She encountered the cosmos, Genesis chapters 2 and 3. Let's look at them for a moment. And we're going to run it out the same way, Genesis chapter 2. Eve encountered the cosmos, and I'll tell you what my bottom line is in teaching this, is Eve encountered it, we'll go where Christ encountered it, but my ultimate thing is you're going to encounter it. Believe me, you'll encounter the cosmos and you'll find out if you overcome evil with good or good with evil. You'll find out which one wins. 
You'll find out, believe me, folks, and I say this to only let you know, prepare your heart, that you're going to encounter this world system. I had an, uh, a, a, a spirit present himself to me one night when I was in Arkansas ministering, and this thing was about seven or eight foot tall, and I was in bed, I was awake around three o'clock in the morning, and when I woke up, I looked around to see if I was in the body or out of the body, see if I'm in the spirit man operating or is it just the physical man, and I slapped a few pillows and the bed, make sure was, I could touch the physical thing, and I don't want to get into all that, but when you do move in the spirit realm or out of your body in the, in the things of the spirit, you can't touch anything tangible. You're, when you try to reach for it, your hand goes on through it. So there's two different worlds, and of course, I believe we know by now our God is more real than this one. This is just a prototype. Amen. Amen. I mean, this, we look at this as this is, this is it. No, it isn't. Not at all. This is just a child from the mother. So, but anyway, I, and I had some experiences like that before, so I had to check and find out if I'm in the body or out of the body. And I found out that I was touching things, hitting things, and I thought, well, I'm in the body, but God let me see him, open his eyes. God let him see, as the prophet told him. And he did. And this thing was standing there, and as I say, he was about seven or eight foot tall, and he had a robe concept on, three-quarter length arms, and I couldn't see him as a figure. He didn't look like a human being. His body inside was all dark clouds like some type of tornado concept. It kept rolling, moving all inside. And all in, the form was there, but all inside was just black clouds rolling. And, of course, my heart was just pounding, boy. And uh, I said, you're not of God. <laughs> that was obvious. It didn't take much discerning the spirits for that. But I said, you're not of God. And before he said anything... I said, you get out of here in the name of Jesus Christ. And boy, he just, he left, he immediately left. Well, the very next night it happened again. And I woke up around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, something like that. Of course, you know, after he left, I had a prayer meeting the rest of the night. Boy, I got before God. I did too. I said, Jesus, Lamb of God, I don't care for this. This is not my choice. And it wasn't. And I don't encourage anybody to get interested in it whatsoever. It's strictly how God leads your life and should you be led by the Spirit to encounter certain things. You just, we just, mainly we want to be ready. Be ready for whenever we meet anything. But, and I'm not saying that you're going to encounter this. You're going to encounter, I believe, a whole lot more subtly. I encountered that one time in life with that experience, but I have encountered this more subtly a thousand times. So this is much more dangerous, this lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life, than sitting there talking to an evil spirit. Believe me. Believe me, that's much more subtle and gets the job much more done. If it wasn't, Satan would rely on the manifestation of his evil spirits more than he does on this subtle approach. But he doesn't. He knows which one's effective more. But the second night, it came back and did the same thing. And this time when I woke up, I leaned up. I reached over and slapped the pillow. And I looked back at him and my heart found He went like this. He raised his hands. And he says, I'm not of God. You're God. But before you speak, listen to what I have to say. I've been sent to make a deal with you. Wow, good land. Boy, just, if, I, if I'd had short hair, it'd have stuck straight up. But, <laughs> but I, I thought, my goodness, my heart's fine. I'm trying to figure out what to do. And I really was. I, I, like I say, I'm not trying to be some spiritual head. I didn't know what to do. I'd just stand there waiting on God. I didn't know what in the world was going on. And I, but God's faithful, folks. That's what's beautiful. He's faithful. And why I listen to this joker, I don't have any idea. But I did. I said, what do you have to say? And he said, see, at that time I was ministering in the area of, of demonology and deliverance. And I've been teaching on this for about a week or so. And he said, I've been sent to tell you this. You go ahead and go to church and pray and minister in the gifts of the Spirit, but you stay out of my kingdom. You see, he found out lots of times just playing church doesn't, doesn't bother him at all. He doesn't even mind. He even okayed it. Go ahead and play church. Doesn't bother me. But you stay out of my kingdom. And he said, if you'll stay out of my kingdom, this is what we'll do for you. I want you to listen to this. He appealed to all three at one time. The flood, the enemy came in like a flood and hit all three areas, and I knew it. I thank God I was aware of this. And he said, we will make you prosperous, successful, and healthy. Prosperous, successful, and healthy. Healthy goes with what part? The body health is the body. Which one's success? Which one's the pride of life? The spirit, the pride of life, successful life, and what's prosperity appeal to? That you may prosper even as your soul prospers. They know where it's at too. They know the scriptures. And he presented those to me on three levels, and I just stood there dumbfounded. Well, I want you to know I wasn't interested in this deal. The word Canaan means to bow. 
That means compromise. To cause one to bow. One of the first enemies you encounter in the land of Canaan is Canaan. First thing you're going to have to deal with is the cosmos on compromise. Either the Word of God's true or it isn't. Either your life is straightened out with Jesus or it isn't. If it isn't, you're going to compromise. But I, I said, I started, all of a sudden I just sitting there waiting on God and I'm telling you the Holy Spirit poured into my heart and I began, the anointing came on me and a real peace came on me and I got to laughing. And I'm going to tell you why I laughed. Thank God for Jesus. He breathed something into my spirit that I had never even thought about before up until that time and it just, just turned me on. And I laughed, I pointed my finger at him and he's still standing like a tornado. And I said, you can't offer me anything that I don't already have in Jesus Christ. What you're offering me is already mine. No deal. No deal. Get out of here in the name of Jesus. Don't come back. Boy, I just, all the time I was laughing because, and after he was over with, I went back in the prayer. I mean, it's frightening. And I went back in the prayer, but now it's not near as frightening. Now I thank God for Jesus. It's true. Jesus Christ provided. He bought my, with his stripes I'm healed. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Thank God he's provided for everything that you may be successful in all that you put your hand to shall prosper. Thank God. I found out that Jesus provided everything the devil's trying to tempt me with. And I want you to know something. Whatever he's offered you, Jesus already gave you anyway. Don't make any deal. Just learn to believe God for it. It's already yours. Just learn to walk in it. Thank God. They'll stop that trash. He doesn't have the thing to offer you that Jesus hadn't given you. Nothing. This world doesn't have a thing to offer us but death. And as soon as you realize that, that flashing glitter and all that rhinestone that she's dressed with won't appeal to you at all. I don't want the flash or the cash. Just give me Jesus and the glory. Amen. Glory to God. Give me the glory of God in my life and the presence of the Lord and forget all the other stuff. And Jesus Christ, in fact, said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. But He'll do it in the way in which it won't control you. That's right. Thank God. But you give yourself and sell out to the world, the world will own you. But we're going to do it in a way in which we can have it but it doesn't have us. Amen. Amen? Thank God for that. You just sell out one time and you'll find out who has who. I even count it. Let's go into that. You found Genesis chapter 2 yet? <laughs> I look at verse 3. Let's just go into that one. Now this is after the fall. Now the serpent, verse 1, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of, us, eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. That's a, just a, a flat lie, a lying spirit. He's a liar from the beginning. For God doth know. Now this is true. What he's about to say is true. It's part of it. Mixed in with truth, mixed in with deception. That in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open. Well, that was true. And you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. But what he didn't tell him is the moment you know it, it'll control you. But he was true on that part. Now notice this. When the woman saw that the tree was good for what? Food. The old bod. Take care of the old bod. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. Which one's that fall under? The old lust of the eyes. Food was the lust of the flesh. Like I said, they may not give their body to some form of adultery, but they might give it to indulgence of eating and sleeping, and Satan gets the same results. All right, next one. And a tree desired to make one wise. The pride of wisdom of this life. So he appealed... On that tree, the knowledge of good and evil, this world system, this cosmos, appeals to the spirit, the soul, and the body. And you're made up of all three. And God wants you to be preserved, blameless, whole, complete, spirit, soul, and body. So you should recognize that and not yield any part of your spirit, soul, and body to the work of this world or to the cosmos. All right, let's look where Jesus encountered. Luke chapter 4. Go to Luke 4. This is why... Jesus said, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me after he experienced Luke 4, not before. There comes a proving time in each one of your lives. And I want you to know something, folks. You may as well listen to me on this and get this really into your heart. There'll come a day that Satan will probe everything of your life and find if there's anything in you that doesn't belong to Jesus. And whatever doesn't belong to Jesus, he'll come to steal, kill, and destroy it. Because John 10.10 10 says, the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Yeah. 
And when he comes to bring his testings, trials, tribulations, and pressure points to you, it's only to find out if there's anywhere in your life, spirit, soul, or your body, that you'll give it to him. And I trust that there isn't. Luke 4. I want to just start with verse 13 for just a moment. Because when the devil had ended, I want you to underline the word all. When the devil had ended all the temptation. Now let's go back and look at them. All of them. And Jesus, verse 1, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Being 40 days tempted of who? God? God doesn't tempt you, folks. He doesn't tempt you with sickness. He doesn't put something on you to teach you anything. The devil does. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy, not God. You need to learn right now who the tempter is. It's not God. James says, let no man say when he's tempted, he's tempted of God. So don't say it. God didn't put anything on you. God leading you this way to teach you something. He teaches you by the words. Being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were in it, he afterward hungered. Now notice this. He was hungry. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made what? What part was he appealing to? Lust of the flesh. Let's read on. Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, I love this guy, that man shall not live by bread alone. Nothing in me and my body, the devil. I don't live by bread. I live by the word of God, but by every word of God. How many lives by the word or, word or by the belly? Which one lives by the word? I trust you all do. Paul said it this way, that your God is your belly. I hope it's not. Because if your God is your belly, I can tell you who your God is. <laughs> and the devil taking him, verse 5, taking him up into a high mountain, showed, S-H-E-W-E-D, visibility, unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 says, the kingdoms of the cosmos. Showed him all the kingdoms of this cosmos in a moment of time. It showed it to him. Which is called, which one? The lust of what? The eyes. Showed him all the kingdoms. Showed it to him at one flash. There it is. And he said this to him. Make a deal. All this power will I give thee and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. Now you can see right away what the lust of the eyes will cause you to do. It will cause you to worship him. If you go for it, somewhere you bowed your knees. That's what I'd like to have. What was that just what I'm looking at right now? I'd like to have that. When you start that stuff from your heart, you're on the way down to idolatry, which is worshiping yourself, which is bowing literally to Satan. All right, look at verse 7. I mean, verse 8. Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. That's exactly what you ought to say. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So then Satan brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thy dash th thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, it is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, the spirit man, involved in leadership and authority or lordship. Thou shalt serve the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. I am not going to tempt my Lord and my God. And there has been a translation that puts it this way, and I, I'm not sure I either am really for it or against it, but it, it's food for thought. When Jesus said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, who's he speaking to? Who is this conversation with? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. I'm your Lord and your God, Satan. Don't tempt me to jump. And I look at that way and I say, well, thank God, through Jesus Christ, I'm Lord over him. Hallelujah. I'm his master, amen? So thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. I happen to be God over you, Satan. I'm your Lord and Master through Jesus Christ, Luke 10, 19. Behold, I have given unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all, A-L-L, -L, all the power of the enemy. Yeah. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Thank God for that. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. How many believes that? Amen. First John says that. So you're the overcomer. You're the victorious. You're the Lord over the powers of Satan. In fact, Jesus Christ has given unto you the keys of the kingdom. Yeah. The whole thing is yours. The earth is, is yours. It's whatever you want to do with it. But we've let the devil rule it and run it the way he wants to do it. But Jesus has placed it into our hands. He said, All power in heaven and in earth has been given unto me. Go, therefore. 
Thank God I like that. I have all authority and power now. I've just delegated it unto you. You go and represent me in my name, be an ambassador of Christ, and do a job of being the light of the world and controlling the issues. Yes. But we don't do it. We just let the devil have his way. When the actuality, Jesus defeated him. Amen? Yes, Absolutely yes. defeated him. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. All right? As a result, Eve encountered, Jesus Christ encountered the cosmos, and when he encountered, he used the... Two-edged sword, the Word of God. It is written, it is written, it is written. And I like what he did because he knew that his spirit, his soul, and his body was subjected to the Word of God and owned by the Lord God of hosts. Yes. Jehovah Jireh owned him. His body was the temple of the Holy Ghost. In fact, the Old Testament says this in Psalms, Thou hast prepared for me a body. And placed God in that body, and God was called Emmanuel. God dwelt among us, or God with us. God manifest in the flesh. And your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost for the same express purpose that you and I might glorify God in our body, in our spirit, in our soul realm. Yes. So you're a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body, they're God's. Yes. The soul is made up of the mind, the will, and the emotions. So you guard, gird up the loins of your mind and protect your thought realm, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ every thought to the obedience of this word. Yes. Now, for some of you, this doesn't mean a thing to you. But for those that are going to go and live their life with Christ, it will cause you to escape hundreds of times from the world's temptations and the world's lures. This cosmos, dressed and arranged for the express purpose to attract you and draw you away from. Ultimate bottom line is to get you away from God. Yes. That's the ultimate. Now, turn to Mark 4. Mark chapter 4, verse 14. The sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately. How many believe that? That's what the word says, doesn't it? Yes. He cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time, Luke says, believe for a season, for a small time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world. There it is. The cares of this cosmos. Here's some more beasts of the world. Cares of the cosmos, deceitfulness of riches, lust of other things enter in, and choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. unfruitful. What is the word it referring to in subject matter? It becometh unfruitful. The seed, the word. Amen, brother. The word of God becomes unfruitful in your life the moment you are drawn away from the word into the world, and the only difference between the word and the world in the surface is the word L. Just take out the L and you got it. So it's not a whole lot of difference when you look at it from the top, but when you get down into it, there's a vast world of difference. There's the world, the, this world, this cosmos, that will run and choke out the Word of God in your life should you get involved in what is called the cares of the cosmos, the deceitfulness of riches, and lust of other things. Those things will enter in, and the moment they do, they choke out the life of the Spirit, the Word of God, the anointing, and the presence of the Lord. You become in a place where no more fellowship. You become an Adam after the fall. You feel this separation between you and God. You are aware of this fact that you are in a position that is backslidden, that the world has captivated you, that the world has control over you, and Satan once again becomes your master, and once again your body becomes his servant, and he begins a slow death to you. And all you got to do is take a look at it, and somewhere you bit the same old apple. You went right to the world for your desire rather than going to God. Proverbs says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Your spirit is the thing that God owns, and out of it flow the issues of life, so that God may captivate your life, and if He can captivate you, thing you'll ever see. That all that beautiful outer array and garment and decoration is just as fruitless and as frivolous and as shallow as anything you'll ever touch. 
And if you don't believe it, look what they have to do on TV that appeals to the eyes. I mean, all these beer commercials are all set up. They're always out in the country. They've got horses, and they've got the springs, and they've got the beautiful oasis, and all that stuff. It appeals to the flesh, the guys that chewing it back and smoking their joints and their weeds and their cigarettes. And it all appeals to the fact that, hey, this is the macho trip. This is the way to go. Look at us. We've got it made. Folks, that's just a shallow... That's what Hollywood makes it. That's her decoration you're looking at. Look at her heart. She's cold, ruthless, and she'll just she'll deceive you every time. I mean, that's the way they make it look. But I want you to know something, folks. That's just here. That's as surface as your eyes. You've got to look at it from a different perspective. That's not at all what it's like. And these, Hollywood makes it... A, do that because it appeals to your flesh. It's supposed to look like the macho trip. And this guy is sitting there, three girls around him, he's got the macho beard, macho shave. Well, what's a macho shave? I mean, my goodness. We all shave the same way, and, except the ladies. And some of the men don't. <laughs> but <laughs> basic. And there's nothing to have to do with macho and ego and shaving. It's a curse to me. It has nothing to do with macho. <laughs> my goodness. But that's what, the, that's what the world makes it look like. They've got three ladies hanging all over him. It's just as surface and it's just as phony as a, as a $15 bill. And we may as well learn that and quit being attracted to that. And if you want to be like anybody, be like Jesus. If anybody is your image of man, let's let it be God. Yeah. Let it be the Lord Jesus Christ and all this other filth and trash. These guys, this guy, he's one foot higher than everybody else, and all these guys are walking this way, and he's got the big coat on walking that way because he's doing his own thing. Why, he's doing like thousands of others. And what used to get me about the, the hippie movement and, and the, the, uh, the liberations of all the, the youth, they all say, hey, I'm not going to be like the social system. I'm through with this government. I'm going to be my own thing. And you can see a thousand, and they all look the same. <laughs> all of them conformed anyway. And I tell you what they conformed to, the same God. He just, meant it, he just changed their clothing. That's all he did. The heart remained the same, but the clothing was different. But he owned the heart. They were still the same. So I want us to be wise as youth and as young people going out into the world. Be wise to it. I mean, the thing is set up to attract you. You must learn that and accept that and believe that because it has been. It's a snare and a trap. And get your eyes off all the macho routines and all the young ladies that they'll have their little ego trips too and get into a sincere, meek and gentle spirit that you can live by that offers a whole lot more than this outward flesh. I have to admit, nothing turns me off any faster than a Christian ego. I mean, people, kids and youth and even men with ego problems turn me off. Because I was one of the most egotistical, and it is nothing but trash and fallacy. Right. You're kidding yourself. The only one that's got any class is Jesus. Right. <laughs> and he's the only one that's got together. The rest of us are all the same. We're just flesh. Right. You've got your imperfections and little problems the same as I have. Yes. So we need to all face that and find out there's nothing in you that is any better than what is in you, and that's Christ. He's the only one that we can glory in. Right. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen? Amen? This world, don't let it deceive you. It's Fleeting, shallow, and just for a moment, it's passing. Poof, and that's it. But they that do the will of God shall abide forever. Father, I thank you for the word of God tonight. And I believe God has fallen on good grounds. That will reproduce 30, 60, and 100 fold after its kinds. And I thank you, God, for exposing to the youth the image of this world as it really is. This hollow, fleeting moments passing away style and system and order. I thank you, God. And Holy Spirit, you want to minister to some of your people tonight. I've made myself available, and I thank you for that anointing right now. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. Oh, thank God. There he's beginning to move now. Thank you for it, Jesus. He's bringing forth the manifestation. Lamb of God, now open your heart to Him. Don't anybody limit God. God wants to minister tonight and bring some miracles in your life and let Him do it. Holy Spirit, we recognize Your presence. And Lamb of God, we give You place tonight. Your desire is to captivate our attentions, our love, not let the world have it, but You want to do it. You'll meet our needs a whole lot better than this world will, God. You're Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that meets all of our needs. He will see and provide. Meet your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. All your needs. And God, we don't go down to Egypt for help. We turn to the living God. And we don't serve Pharaoh. We serve Jesus. Thank God. Amen.
This young lady right here that I brought out first, Margaret, is that right? Correct? He says that you're going to be a fruitful vine in his hand, Margaret. That he's going to touch your spirit and bring out an abundance of fruit. From out of your spirit, the Lord says, will be the fruit of love and joy and peace. And there shall be many that stand by that shall recognize your joy and your fruitfulness. And they will come to partake of it and they will enjoy the refreshing wherewith you are able to refresh them. For there will be many that will desire a drink of cool water, those that are thirsty and dry and parched, and your fruits shall be able to quench them, for I will cause you to be a fruitful vine, and the vine is called the planted of the Lord. You shall not be a wanderer or a roamer, saith the Lord, but I will plant you and cause you to be the planted of the Lord, and there you shall grow up and blossom, and in that place will I call for that fruit to rise up, and many shall see that the Lord has increased you and caused you to be fruitful in the land, and they will call you the fruitful vine. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lamb of God. That's a prophecy or projection of your future. Then when he's through with your life, you'll be the planted. You'll stay that someday. It'll mean more to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. The young lady right here on my left. What was your name again? Karen. The Lord says, Within your spirit is a meekness and a gentleness of which he wants to use. For the Lord says, That from out of your heart I have placed my spirits, and I will begin to mold and fashion your heart to be oh so sensitive to my breath, to my spirit. And your heart will be cultivated, and it shall be prepared by the Lord. For I will take your heart and prepare it and cause it to be a heart of flesh, easily sensitive, easily moved, easily provoked by the Lord and not by anything else. And I will cause to come out of you meekness and gentleness, of which others also shall be fed by that. And you shall go forth spreading meekness and spreading gentleness, for I will cause you to be kind." And you shall see the troubles of others, but you will be kind to them. Others that are around you that have tasted the rejection, the reproach, and the rebuke of others' tongues, you shall speak a word in season to them, a word that is kind. And that word shall minister life and acceptance unto them. And no longer shall they feel rejected or an outcast, but you shall make them feel welcome. For within you and through you shall be my spirit of kindness that makes them welcome to my bosom also. Thank you for it, God. Let's give him thanks for his ministry. Father, I thank you for it. I thank you for it, Jesus. I praise you for it, Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of God. This young brother I spoke to, Mike, is that right? Mike, the Spirit of the Lord says, I'm going to make you a leader of my people. I'm going to place my word nigh in your heart and in your mouth, and I'll, you'll open your mouth, and I'll fill it with my word, saith the Lord. And I will cause you, even as the youth Samuel, as he rose up, I let none of his words fall to the ground. So shall I teach you my word, and the words that you speak will not be your own words, but you'll speak the word only. And the word that I speak through your mouth, it shall not fall to the ground, but I shall will show you that when I speak to you, I will perform it also. For I will cause your lips and your tongue to be touched by the fires of the coals of God and your mouth will speak forth the utterance of the Holy Spirit and you shall speak forth the word of God and I'll bring it forth with an anointing and with power and it shall flow out of your mouth with as a hammer that breaks in pieces the work of the enemy and you shall let my people go saith the Lord because I'll raise you up with the word of deliverance and it shall smite the enemy and set my people free thank God amen for leadership father thank you for it God Blessed be the name of God. Spirit of the living God. Spirit of the living God. I see in your heart, young lady, right here in front of me, a ministry that is a, right now is hidden. It's aloof. It stands off. And Jesus said He's going to prepare it, though. For there will be a time of preparation. A time in your life that I will do a deep work. And I exhort you, saith the Lord, not to be captivated or conscious of the element of time of which I began to prepare and work deep within you. For I am doing an inward work. Those around you may want to look at the signs of the outward woman. But I say unto you, I am doing a work within, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. And when I have perfected that which I have begun, for I will perform it and perfect it, and when I have, a, I have finished that which I have begun in your life, then I'll call for it. 
Then I'll riot, raise it up. Then I'll bring it forth and show it unto many. And you shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. And you shall be a vessel that will show forth the praises of the Lord, for the light of the glory of God is risen upon you. And you shall be a vessel that will manifest my presence and my glory in the midst of my people, but it shall be after a long time of preparation. So be caught not up within this area of looking for the fruit or motivated by the peers of others, but be motivated by my spirits. And you will see that I'm doing a good work and a deep work, and you will appreciate the quality of it later. Thank God. Thank you for it, Father. Thank you, Jesus. I won't forget the others. I'm just having another direction right now. God has reminded me of, of you, and I will be back. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Somebody's released faith, and it's touched the hem of his garment, and it just brought it forth out of me, and I want to take time and minister it. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit of God. Holy Spirit of God. My brother, Amen. stand up for just a moment, brother, I want to minister to you. Yes, thank you, Jesus. The Word says, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Give no thought to the direction of your life and to the decisions that will come before you, for it will be I in you, not yourself. And you will be still and learn to stand still and watch the salvation of the Lord. For I will raise you up and cause you to be a warrior of the Lord, a fighter. But I will teach you the warfare and the weapons of which I have given to you that will not tire you. And they are not carnal nor fleshly weapons, but they are spiritual. And you will learn to be still and know that the Lord, He is God. And you shall always stand forth and watch the delivering power of God, the salvation of the Lord, and the healing power of God as it flows out of your life. For I have anointed you, saith the Lord, and I will raise you up in the last days. And when I call for that anointing and I bring it forth out of your life, then you shall go forth and I shall be with you. And I will confirm the word with signs following in your life. For I will raise you up to demonstrate the signs and the wonders in this day and age that my people need to see and have their needs met. For you shall be a carrier both of the word and of the spirit. For I will develop you to minister both in the Word and in the Spirit. And you will see that the Spirit shall rise up big within you. And you shall go forth and God shall deliver and heal and set free because of the anointing that is upon you. It shall not be by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. For it is the anointing that breaks the yoke. And I will use the anointing in your life from out of your body shall flow the virtue of God. And it shall lift from off the shoulders the heavy burdens of the people. And it shall remove from around their necks the yoke of bondage, and they shall go free because you have been faithful and let me order your steps. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lamb of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The young lady right here, what was your name again, sis? Sandy? Sandy. Spirit of the Lord. Spirit of the living God. I bless the name of my God right now for Sandy. I thank you. I'd like for you to come up here for a moment. Sandy, I'd like to minister to you. My brother, the word comes to me, as Jesus said the scripture, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And God has revealed to me in the discerning of spirits that there has been troubles in your life, trouble, that there has come against your mind a lot of trouble. And God says, I'm going to set you free from a confusing concept and a troubled heart. I'm going to relieve you, relieve you tonight of the trouble that has surrounded your life and bring clarity to your vision, spiritual vision, and clarity to your direction of life. No longer are you going to grope as in noonday, but the glory of the Lord and the light of the Lord is going to smite the darkness of confusion and bring you clarity. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I lay hands upon this young lady. And I rebuke the trouble that tries to come against her mind and against her life. I thank you, God, in the name of Jesus Christ right now. I release her of it in the name of Jesus. I break the influence of it. I go to the root of the problem and I lay the acts of God to that problem and I break that force in the name of Jesus. And I release to her, God, clarity 
of mind, clarity of thinking, clarity of direction. And I thank you, God, from this night on, this will no longer be a problem for her mental woman in the name of Jesus Christ. I bring healing to her body right now. Body, I say you be healed every whit whole in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, God, for delivering her and for setting her free in the name of the Son of the living God. For this spirit, God, needs a refreshing and reviving, a touch of your presence and the anointing of God, which will secure her faith in you. And I'm asking for it tonight, God, in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. And I thank you for it, God. Blessed be the name of God. Blessed be the name of God. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I thank you, Father. I have a word for you too, sis. Thank you, Jesus. Hmm. Thank you for it, God. The word comes to me that what he will do from this night on is begin to restore unto you that which the worm has eaten, the canker worm, the locust, the caterpillar, that which the devourer has laid his hand to in your life, I'm going to restore it to you a hundred folds. What you have lost and what has been robbed from you shall be returned back unto you a hundred times over. And when you had depression, I've given you the spirit of joy and of gladness for the spirit of heaviness. I've replaced the heaviness, the trouble, with my spirit of anointing and gladness, and I'm going to cause you to be a joyful vine, one that is joyful, bringing forth great abundance of joy, for what has worked against you has been depression, but what will manifest through you now shall be joy. And those that saw you in the past will glorify God because they'll see you as you are now, one who will manifest joy. And you are free from depression, you are free from the oppression and you will experience the joy of the Lord which will be strength unto you and laughter and happiness all the days of your life because God's going to turn your sorrow into a blessing. I thank you for it, God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Now has turned my morning into dancing. Thank God. Thank you, Jesus. And Father, that's what you gave me in the beginning, but I don't limit the Holy One of Israel. Thank you, Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. Does anybody have a need that they'd like to have brought out and be ministered to right now? Yes, sis. I want you to know you're not without his help. Thank God. You're not without his help. If the Lord be for you, who can be against you? Amen. No weapon formed against you, young lady, shall prosper. I believe that. Father, we execute your word right now on her behalf. And we don't turn to the mother and the dad problem. The root of the problem is Satan. And I break the power of Satan over that parent's life in the name of Jesus. I break the deceiving spirit, the lying demons, in the name of Jesus Christ. I rebuke those deceiving lying spirits right now in the name of the Son of the living God. I command them in the name of Jesus to depart, for the God of this world has blinded their eyes. But I break the influence and the power of the God of this world, and their eyes shall now be opened in the name of Jesus. From this night on, God, I believe their eyes are open in Jesus' name, and they shall come unto the knowledge of the truth, for my God is able. And he's willing, thank God. He's willing to do it. And I believe you're going to work right now, angels of the Lord, ministering for those that are heirs of salvation. Thank God. Is anybody here got any physical problem they'd like to have prayer for? Any physical problem in your body? Yes. Ingrown Tony, what do you have, sis?
You know you understand properly. Bless God. Anyone else? Yes, my brother. What you got? You have a lot? I want you guys to come on up here. Anyone else? These things will go. Bad what? Another ingrown toenail. Anyone else? Yes, sis. You have it a lot? Just tonight? Have you had any problem with your chest before? Come on up here, sis. Anyone else? Anyone else? I'm going to read the Word of God to you. What saith the Scriptures? Doesn't matter what I say. My opinion doesn't mean a thing. Neither to me or to God. These signs shall follow them that believe. How many of you here believe? Okay. One of those is one we're interested in right now. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Jesus said that. Thank God. I want you to get your mind on that. Jesus said that. Wasn't a man, wasn't a doctor, wasn't a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Jesus said, these signs are going to follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and what shall they do? They shall recover. Christy, I'd like for you to join me, sis. I want you to pray with me about these. God's healed her of a, of a real physical problem, and freely she has received, and freely she's going to give. Come right up here, and we'll just go right down the line. Move back just a little bit in a straight line. And I want you all, and I, I share this to say this to you, that I know that there is what is called a legit slaying in the Spirit, where the anointing comes and people go down. I'm more inclined to exhort to beware and make more attention to the fact of letting the anointing stay in your body because what happens when the anointing comes, sometimes we turn that into just being slain. And we forget what we're really wanting to receive. We're not wanting to be receive going down, we want to receive our healing. So sometimes when some try to go down, I hold them up for the express purpose. I want you to receive your healing. And whether you feel an anointing or don't feel anointing is not what final authority is. What you feel has nothing to do with what the Word of God says. Amen? All right, we're going to lay hands on you in the name of Jesus. And the Word of God says, you shall recover. Final word. I want you to say right now, my Father, my father I, shall I shall recover the moment hands are laid on me. Because your Word says it. And it doesn't matter how I feel right now or before or after. It matters only what your Word says. Your word, says, your word says, I shall recover. I shall recover. That's good enough for me. Good Amen. Amen. Come join us, sis. We'll just lay hands on them together. Father, we lay hands on these people in the name of Jesus Christ. And I release healing into this body right now. This skin problem, I break the power. I go to the root of the problem. And I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Right now, there's the anointing. Just stand right there and receive that anointing. In the name of the Son of the living God, we lay hands on this woman, God, in the name of Jesus. And I speak healing to her body. Be healed and delivered from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. From this moment on, she absolutely shall recover. I lay hands on this man's body, God, according to the word of God. I speak to this toe. I say, be healed in the name of Jesus right now. Be healed. Amen. Receive it, brother. Thank God. I lay hands on this woman. I speak to this chest problem. I command it in the name of Jesus Christ to be healed. And she absolutely shall recover in Jesus' name. Pain, you be gone from this body. You be gone from this body in the name of Jesus. Now let your spirit source this. Get more than just the healing. God, I lay hands on this young man in the name of the Son of the living God. And I break the power of Satan over his life in this body. This body is the temple of God. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed of every physical problem in that body in Jesus' name. And God, I thank you right now, the anointing of God upon this young man. Be healed of this total problem in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God, the anointing. It's the anointing right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank God. Amen. Thank you, lady. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father, I praise you. I'd like for us to stand now and give him thanks for tonight. Father, I exalt your name. I glorify. Let's give him praise tonight. I praise you, God. I exalt your name of God. Give my sister. Give her a word from God, oh Lord. Oh, Lamb of God. Oh, Lamb of God.
arm of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Christy, I have a word from the Lord for you. Thank you, Lamb of God. Thank you, Spirit of the Lord. The Word of the Lord says, I'm going to enlarge your spirit. There's going to come an immediate change in growth into your spirit of maturity. For right tonight, I will begin a work of enlargement. For I desire to work in your spirit and make more room for my spirit and my work in your life. I'm going to add unto you capability and ability. There's going to flourish out of you the mind of Christ and the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God, and discreet understanding. And you shall be a woman of enlarged spirit and of enlarged heart and there shall be come out of your life the gift of God that proves itself to be strong, for you shall be one that shall also come forth in the fullness of the things of the Spirit, for God shall touch your spirit right now and enlarge you and give you ability and potential that has excelled your present position. I thank you now, God, in the name of Jesus. I speak to the Spirit. Be enlarged in the name of Jesus. Receive the fullness, the maturity, and the elevation of God. For it's time for promotion, God. It's time for spiritual promotion to Christie's life. And I thank you, God, she's served you faithfully. She's worked in the field and in the harvest of God. And I'm asking you, God, to promote her in the name of Jesus in all spiritual matters, wisdom and knowledge and understanding, even as you've spoken in Jesus' name. And Romans says of, the, uh, of Abraham that against hope he believed in hope that he might become exactly what was spoken. Yeah. Thank God. I believe that, Father. She shall become exactly yeah. as it has been spoken. Yeah. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. I've enjoyed this fellowship with you tonight. Next week, should the Lord tarry and the rapture take place, and if the rapture should take place, don't show up, we won't be here.